Um, welcome to the Housing Commission's July 7th, 2021 regular meeting. This is a teleconference meeting with Housing Commission members, city staff, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. I will call the meeting to order at 7.36 p.m. And I would like to start, or sorry, 6.36 p.m., not 7.36 p.m. I wanna start um, by introducing the Housing Commissioner members present, um, Commissioner Leach, Commissioner Bigelow, Commissioner Horst, uh, and Commissioner Nguyen, and myself, um, Commissioner Grove. And so, and absent today so far are Commissioner Pimentel and uh, Commissioner Merriman, who is out of town. Um, in addition, we have staff, Deputy Community Development Director Rhonda Kaufman and Assistant Community Development Director Deanna Chow and Management Analyst to Mike Noche and also Cal, I don't have your title here, but welcome. Um, you, Cal, do you wanna pop on and tell us your title? Hi there, good evening, everyone. My name is Calvin Chan. I'm a senior planner with the Community Development Department. Thank you. Okay, so um, Mike, could you please provide instructions to the Housing Commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Of course, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and welcome Housing Commissioners, and welcome everyone uh, in attendance this evening to the July 7th Housing Commission meeting. At this time, we ask that the members of the Housing Commission please remain on the screen for the duration of the meeting. You will control your own webcams and microphones. Staff will engage cameras and microphones to make presentations and respond to members of the Housing Commission. For members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raised hand feature or via telephone, press nine to raise your hand to speak. I will then have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide your public comment to the Housing Commission. And that concludes my instructions and I'll return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, let me just make one, I think, correction is if you're joining by telephone, you need to press star nine to raise your hand. And I think you just said nine, is that right? Thank you for that, that sure. addition. Sure. That is correct. Okay, and before I introduce public comment, I wanna just quickly acknowledge that we are, if we're in Menlo Park, on Ramachush Ohlone land. And I wanna respect that. And I also just wanna welcome uh, Commissioner Nguyen and, and um, Commissioner Leach to their first meeting. So under public comment, the public may address the Housing Commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the Housing Commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The Housing Commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore the Housing Commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Uh, Mike, do we have any public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a reminder for anyone who just joined, uh, for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide uh, public comment, uh, when the chair calls on the item that you wish to speak on, please engage the raised hand feature. And that is star nine for anyone calling in. And I will then have the ability to open your microphone. It does look like we have one uh, speaker. So let me just engage the timer. And our first public comment will be from Bruce McHenry. And Bruce, I'm going to allow you to open your microphone and you should be able to address the uh, Housing Commission. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I was hoping to be able to present a, uh, a short slideshow here, but it doesn't look like I'm going to have that opportunity. So um, maybe I'll just share that with the Commission after, after the fact. Um, but um, my uh, concern mainly is with the, uh, the new SRI um, uh, availability. Um, my last employer, so happens. Um, my point is that 
almost all of the housing in, in Menlo Park is for what I call chimpanzees. That's you know, basically our parents and us as parents. And uh, the new generation uh, needs something better because chimpanzees suck resources. And, um, and Menlo Park needs to beat Atherton and build bigger homes for human beings. As Conrad Lorenz said, the Nobel laureate Conrad Lorenz, man is the missing link between apes and human beings. And while <clears throat> chimpanzees are clearly apes, there is an example in the animal world of bonobos who are much more peaceable and manage somehow to control their population so that they do not stress their food supply and become violent fighting over it. So we need to build bigger homes for human beings in traditional families. And what are traditional families? Well, they, they have all ages. And we have those in Menlo Park. We have 20 somethings who need to build equity instead of pouring money down the rent rat hole. We need people in their 30s and 40s who are parents and they need help with parenting. Children need to hear, need to hear 30,000 words a day. When parents, both of them, are busting ass to make mortgage, they don't have time to raise the kids that they have. It's a tragedy. It's an absolute horror in this valley. The number of people who are diagnosed with Asperger's because they haven't been talked to as children, as toddlers. People in their 50s and 60s need to stop the waste, living in homes with rooms that are unused most of the time. And people in their 70s and up, they can help. They have time to help raise toddlers, to raise kids, to impart their wisdom. Let's stop building chimpanzee homes in SRI, let there not be any more chimpanzee homes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have any other public comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. And just looking at the list of attendees now, and just a reminder for anyone who's joined, you can use the raised hand feature to provide a public comment to the Housing Commission. And not seeing any additional hands at this time, I will return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. All right. Uh, so under regular business, the Housing Commission receives informational presentations in addition to considering policy matters and administrative actions. Are there any clarifying questions from the Housing Commission on item D1, which is to approve the minutes from the Housing Commission meeting of March 3rd, 2021, before taking public comment on this item? No, okay, seeing none. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Madam Chair, and not, not to be redundant, but for members who are in attendance, members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment on this item, please engage the raised hand feature now. I will then have the ability to open your microphone. And not seeing any hands raised, I will return the meeting to the chair. Okay, so the item is open for Housing Commission discussion, or I would entertain a motion and a second. So moved. And okay, so Leach and Horst. Okay, so I will ask if anyone dissents. Seeing none, um, uh, does anybody abstain? And does then let's just show of hands who approves. Okay, all righty, the motion passes. Um, so moving on to item D2, these are informational updates. We're, we're moving on to the informational update on the housing element process and schedule. 
um, Assistant Community Development Director Deanna Chow will introduce item D2. Welcome, Deanna. Hi, thank you, Chair Grove. Thank you for having me, uh, Housing Commissioners. I am uh, Deanna Chow, the Assistant Community Development Director, and I believe you met Cal Chan, our senior planner, who is also assisting on uh, this effort as well, um, joining us here this evening. So again, thank you for having us. I know this is um, something of interest, not only to the Housing Commission, but to our larger community, and it is um, a priority of our city council um, as well. So um, I do have just a few slides that I thought I'd just share. Um, they're similar to ones that um, you may have seen in, in previous um, presentations that were provided uh, either at our webinar or introduction with our city council back in May, but I thought it might just be helpful for our conversation this evening. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then um, we can go, just go through it. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Awesome. Okay. Oddly, my screen looks different than it normally does when I share my screen. So that's why I'm looking at probably a little bewildered right now, trying to trying to figure out my my screen. But okay. So our housing element update. So it is more than just our housing element. It is a combination of three elements of our general plan. So it's our housing element, which like many other cities in the Bay Area are um, updating its process for the next RENA cycle um, or our regional housing needs allocation cycle. It's the sixth cycle and it's for the next planning period, which is for the years 2023 20, to 2031. Um, in addition to our housing element, the city is also updating our safety element and we are embarking um, on a, a new element in our general plan and that is the environmental justice element. So this slide shows um, our regional housing need allocation for the next planning period. Um, and just as a comparison, it shows um, what our current cycle is, which is the fifth cycle and it shows what is projected to be our allocation for the sixth cycle. It also shows what it is for the Bay Area as a whole, a nine county whole, San Mateo County, um, and then also Menlo Park. And as you can see, the difference between the fifth and sixth cycle, there is a, a dramatic increase in the numbers, um, not only for Menlo Park, but as a, a region as a whole. And I think this is reflective of our um, high opportunity areas, our need for housing, the increase in jobs that we've experienced over the last eight years. Um, and so each jurisdiction jurisdiction has experienced a growth in their numbers. I think Menlo Park probably um, proportionally has a, a higher increase in um, housing than other jurisdictions, but I think that is reflective of our um, our, our you know, high quality of life that we enjoy here in Menlo Park with our schools, access to transit, jobs, um, and, and the high quality or high opportunity areas. So our current cycle is 655 units and I believe the uh, Housing Commission saw a um, our, our uh, annual progress report earlier this year, which identifies us doing a great job in providing housing overall uh, we have met that number as a total number, but in terms of meeting specific income categories, which you'll, you'll see on the next slide, there is um, room for improvement. In the sixth cycle, uh, we were almost at 3,000 housing units, and you'll hear often, you know, as we have these conversations, we have to plan for almost 3,000 housing units. We probably need to plan for actually probably a little bit more because we need to create a buffer um, to satisfy HCDs or the state's housing and community development departments needs that we can demonstrate our, our um, ability to meet our arena number. Um, and just for comparison, again, the lower, um, I guess, graph or bar uh, chart shows um, what the, the lowest um, allocation is in the town of Colma, the average number of uh, units across the 21 or 21 jurisdictions, including the county, 
um, in San Mateo County and then the highest of which is in the city of San Mateo. Let's see. And so here is a breakdown of our uh, RENA by income category. So as I mentioned for the fifth cycle, we have met our total number, but we have um, not achieved all of the lower income categories. So we've achieved a number of higher income uh, or above moderate housing units. In the sixth cycle, you can see that they are split amongst different income categories between very low income um, to moderate and then the remaining numbers of that 3,000 housing units um, would, oh, I'm sorry, yes, above, very low, low, moderate, and then you see the largest portion is in the above moderate income category. So what, uh, what is the process? <laughs> what, you know, what are we going through? Um, so it is um, a state mandate that these are, that the housing element be adopted by January of 2023. And so this will be an intense, um, I guess, 16 to 18 month process that we go through um, until, until um, adoption, which is targeted for the winter of 2022 with the city council. So over the next couple of months, I think will be um, some of the most intensive periods in terms of commission participation and community engagement and outreach because a lot of the um, site identification, policy conversations, um, drafting of the plans themselves happened this year. And um, maybe there's a question of like why um, it happens um, in the next several months. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is the environmental review process. So in order for us to prepare our environmental impact report, we must have our project description. And so that project description it involves identifying uh, potentially where, where housing might be located, at what densities, what, um, what we want to study. Um, and so the document itself is uh, a time intensive um, process and so we need to identify what that what that project description is at this point um, to prepare that document for release next spring uh, to go through um, its review process. Uh, and the other item is we also do a check-in with HCD early on in the process. So we do give HCD a, a draft of our plan to make sure that we are um, on the right track. And, and so that is something that we submit to them um, earlier in the process and we receive feedback and may need to tweak here or there based upon um, comments that they provide back to us. So those are some of the things that are milestones that we need to hit, which then lend itself to a, a, a quite intensive process over the next, um, over the next several months through the end of the year. So just looking here at our um, sort of major milestones, you can see buckets, um, the first being the visioning and existing conditions, which we are currently in that phase right now. So we are um, looking at uh, preparing our existing conditions reports and also um, as part of that, um, reaching out to various groups. So I'll talk a little bit more about our outreach efforts and how um, that is factoring in into our um, understanding our existing concerns and different perspectives here in the city. So that's uh, occurring now um, over the next uh, month or two. Um, in addition, um, a familiar furthering for housing is new to the housing element um, this year. Um, and so that will be a big um, part of our conversation around where should housing be located. We will be looking at um, site identification to um, support our, our and plan for the 3000 housing units that I mentioned earlier as part of the, the arena. Um, and, that, and that is looking to um, provide housing across, across the city as a whole. Uh, moving on, uh, we do have our site selection and draft plan uh, that would be happening at the end of this year. And so again, that would be the three elements that I mentioned, the housing, environmental justice and safety element. And then you see their land use element in zoning updates. So um, if there are changes that would require um, 
changes to our land use or, or zoning for consistency or policy changes. That's why you see land use and, and zoning changes there. So for example, if a land use strategy identifies um, a new zoning district to help achieve our numbers, that would be a zoning code amendment. Um, and so that, that is um, a consideration um, and, and something that we need to plan for as well. And then, as I mentioned a little bit ago, the environmental analysis is a big component of the project. Um, we do plan on having um, the notice of preparation, which is a technical term and part of our, our California Environmental Quality Act, um, but it, it basically initiates or it, it starts the conversation around what uh, is to be studied in our environmental impact report and um, the release of the document is intended for um, the next, next spring. So uh, my apologies, that should say spring of 2022 um, for, for um, the release of the, the EIR. Um, in addition, we also will be looking at the fiscal implications. So there will be a fiscal impact analysis that is prepared that looks at um, what would the additional housing um, do to the uh, city's general fund um, we will also be looking at how it impacts um, schools as well. Um, that was something that we, that the city council um, asked uh, to expand the scope of the fiscal impact analysis. And then finally, you see um, the adoption and certification and the housing commission will be a recommending body on the housing element. Um, and so, uh, but before then, we will be coming back to you. So let me get to a little bit more of, you know, where does the Housing Commission fit in with this overall um, major milestones? So the Housing Commission um, is, is sort of one piece of a, a much larger, um, I guess, community engagement and outreach um, effort. So we have the Housing Commission, the Planning Commission, the City Council, specifically created the Community Outreach and Engagement Committee, which is focused on um, creating a robust outreach program for the housing element project. We have a city council subcommittee and certainly we have the city council itself. And so um, there are a number of different reviewing bodies and input, and that is an opportunity to provide the, the, the greatest uh, amount of input, I believe. So there are probably three primary um, roles or tasks that we would be reaching out to for the Housing Commission support. Um, and that would be looking at land use alternatives. So that would involve uh, site selection and site strategies, policies and programs. So um, what are some of our goals, policies and programs in our, in our housing element? And then uh, the draft housing element itself. So before we go to city council, we would be looking for um, recommendation from the Housing Commission on the draft housing element program. Probably the first, um, some of these dates are still in flux, but uh, we hope to come to you um, in the near future to have that policy conversation about what, what are some of the um, uh, objectives or principles or um, um, implementation programs that we should include in the housing element. I know, and we've heard, you know, questions and concerns about displacement, our BMR ordinance. Um, and so those are just some of the things that we um, might be able to identify as are ways to uh, address housing needs in the city. So from a policy conversation, um, that is one, one, um, opportunity that we would like for some feedback from the Housing Commission. Another um, idea that we're working on is a joint meeting with the Planning Commission to discuss uh, the site selection and the land use strategies. Uh, so that that um, is another opportunity that we would like um, to engage with the Housing Commission. And then um, next year, we would look towards the, the draft housing element. And so um, we do see the, the Housing Commission having a role um, focused on policy conversations um, in, in, in the near future um, so that we can start crafting, crafting that plan that I mentioned um, in the project description. 
So I'll just touch upon briefly outreach and engagement. You know, as housing commissioners, we lean on you. You know the neighborhood. We we hope that you will be, you know, also our cheerleaders and ambassadors in, in working with the community and making sure that, uh, you know, they are aware of what is um, happening with the, with the housing element. We're happy to come back and report to this group um, on a monthly basis, you know, um, to keep you informed of what is what is happening. Um, and so just a, a few of the near term items. So we are working on a citywide survey um, and that is to gain perspective, to gain an understanding of what are some of the, what are the issues and concerns um, and opportunities uh, for the city. So we expect that to be out in the, probably the latter part of, of the month. Um, we are also, we just had our, our first introduction webinar last Thursday and uh, anticipate having some additional uh, community meetings once we dive into more of the, the topics. So having uh, more conversations around site strategies, site selection, um, and some of the policy questions. Uh, the existing conditions that I, I mentioned earlier will be um, informed by focus groups that we're going to be, uh, focus group meetings that we'll be conducting uh, in the next uh, probably a couple of weeks, early August, and that is with um, renters, homeowners, um, uh, housing uh, developers, both for-profit and non-profit, um, housing uh, service providers, um, as well as uh, local businesses. So we hope that that will provide a breath, a, a wide variety of information, um, again, to help um, establish some of what are existing concerns and what are some of you know the opportunities that we could um, uh, uh, achieve. So uh, the CEOC is uh, a big part of our outreach and engagement. So it is a um, right now a, a twelve member body um, representing folks from all of the districts and helping us make sure that we are using the right channels, you know, communications, you know, where do we reach people, you know, what is the best way to, um, are they online, in person, um, uh, you know, is interpretation services needed? So, you know, we are working with the CEOC to help um, plan for these events. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, meetings already and our next meeting will be happening um, next Thursday on the 15th. And then, um, as I mentioned, Housing and Planning Commission having uh, a role, uh, Planning Commission uh, being a primary land use body. So they will be um, also sharing um, in providing feedback on our uh, site strategies and, and um, policy matters, and then um, diving more deeply into the uh, CEQA or the environmental review process itself. Uh, and then, pop-up events and, and general outreach meetings. Again, um, we're hoping to go where people are. So some of those pop-up events, if they may be at a farmer's market or at a local supermarket, we're, we're trying to identify where in the community can we um, provide information to folks. Um, to, so us going to where people are. And how do I stay informed? So we do have a project website. It is, uh, being updated as, as we move forward in, in the process. So check it often, please. Um, and you can also sign up for updates. So the website is menlopark.org slash housing element. Um, and you can see here on, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can sign up for updates and um, you can um, receive updates from us. And then you could um, find more information about upcoming events, um, and as I mentioned there, one of the things that we're advertising right now is if you are a homeowner or a renter would like to par participate in a focus group, um, you can register, oh, I'm sorry. Well, this is for the webinar, but right now it's, <laughs> it, right now it says there's a focus group. So this is an old screenshot, but there is right now it says you can sign up to join on the, on the focus group um, and you can um, do that as well. So this is our, our primary tool right now to, to, uh, to keep uh, folks informed. And then um, here's that information again for, for the focus groups. Deadline is 
this uh, this Friday, um, and then we'll um, be selecting the folks to participate in the in those groups. So with that, I think that wraps up sort of my slides. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions that you may have, or if we don't have a response for you to bring that back um, at a future at a future time and. Again, we look forward to um, working with the Housing Commission to advance this project. Um, I'm very excited to be working on this project. Again, I know it's um, a, a very important project for our community and, um, and I hope to yeah, continue the conversation with you guys. All right. All right. So at this time, I want to ask if any of us commissioners have any clarifying questions, and then we'll go to public comment, and then we'll open it up for commissioner discussion. So clarifying questions. Uh, I think I saw Chelsea's hand go first. So Chelsea, commissioner. Yes, Miss Chow. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm wondering. I know that you would like to get some feedback from the Housing Commission. I'm just wondering, um, you said near future, can you just give me a more definitive um, response as to exactly when you expect these deliverables? A month, two months, three months? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Wen. Um, I believe that we may be coming back to you as soon as your August meeting to start having some policy conversations. Uh, we probably do a joint meeting um, soon thereafter with the with the planning commission. So I expect the next several months we'll be coming back to having more in-depth conversations. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And is my screen still showing? My like I said, I'm sorry, yeah. my it is. I'm trying to to change it, but my screen is having some issues here. I think we can adjust the size of the presentation and see our face, you know, we can each individually give preference to faces, so don't worry about it too much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Commissioner Horst. Thank you uh, for the presentation. There seem to be a lot of opportunities to provide feedback, a lot of different venues trying to get input from all possible groups. So can you talk a little bit about who's going to be collecting the feedback and how all that feedback from all these different places is going to get consolidated and ultimately incorporated. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you, Commissioner Horst. So yes, we are trying to reach out, but if we aren't able to sort of assemble the information and provide it back, that's not going to be very useful information. So uh, I failed to mention that we are working with the M group who, um, is the lead um, with the staff who are, is our consultant, our partner on this project. So it's not just myself and, and Cal working on it. We do have um, a very experienced uh, consultant assisting us um, on, this, uh, on this project. So um, we do um, have a team who will be you know, collecting that information. And we know we've heard it's very important for us to have that sort of um, that loop, you know, like how did, how is my voice heard? So we wanna make sure that, you know, we're gonna be sharing the information that we heard. So there will be, uh, there will need to be like, you know, follow-ups like this is the, the results from the surveys. You know, this is what we gathered. Here's a summary of the, what we heard from um, the community meeting. And sometimes what we do um, is maybe real-time note-taking. Um, I think that's important for folks to see that their, their comments are being heard. And so we do like real-time note-taking um, so that there is, um, and to you know, make sure that we're capturing the comments correctly as well. So um, we, we do plan on sharing back out the information so that hopefully it doesn't get lost. You know, it doesn't feel like it's just out there, but um, sharing how how was the information used um, and bringing that back um, and sharing that with the community. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, I have a few. Um, when is the HCD housing something department? Community, yes, housing and community development, the state housing and community development yes. department, yes. The state 
Housing and Community Development Department. When is that check-in required? You know, there must be a window when we are required to check in with them or have the opportunity. When is that specifically? I don't have the specific date. I was looking at our, our timeline. I want to say it's probably sometime early next year that we need to have that that check-in. Okay. With them, and that's what's um, I think driving some of the timeline. Okay. But and probably more importantly, I think also is our our CEQA. We want to make sure that we have um, our, our you know our consultants. Uh, ESA has the right. Uh, the time it needs to prepare the environmental impact report. So does that start with the notice of preparation? Do we do that or does ESA, the consultant group, do that? The sub-consultant group? The, the city will issue it. Um, okay. The doc, I mean, technically the document may be prepared by the consultant, but the city will issue the notice of preparation and then there will be a meeting with the uh, planning commission um, during the, what we call is the sort of the, the scoping period or the, the 30, the window of like, what would you like to study in the notice of preparation? Um, so that would happen with the, the planning commission once it's issued. Okay, so that was part of my question is to clarify what is the notice of preparation like functionally and when will that take place? Yes, so um, I'll, I'll, we're working on, on a more refined schedule because I think Given where we are um, and trying not to compress too much of our public outreach, we're looking at an opportunity to potentially um, have a little bit more breathing room. Um, so we're, we're working on when when that that NOP will be released, but it would be um, my guess. It'll be sometime this year. My 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 guess. Okay. And is the same question with the fiscal analysis, is the answer the same? You don't, not sure, but sometime in 2021 or? That generally happens later in the process. So usually the FIA will be released concurrently uh, at the time that the EIR is released. Okay, and I think that was spring. That would be like more of a spring time frame. Okay. Spring, summer, probably. Okay. Is there the equivalent of a notice of preparation for the fiscal impact analysis where there's like a review of what questions we're asking? There, there's not, there's not a, a, a sort of a notice of preparation or um, associated with an, with an FIA. Hmm. Is there an opportunity for us maybe through our monthly informational check-ins to review what is going to be studied in terms of fiscal impact analysis? Yeah, and, and the, um, so BAE is the consultant that is um, collaborating with our team for the preparation of the FIA. Their, their scope is available and I can share it with, with the um, Housing Commission. Okay. Thank you. Um, when, um, I don't know if this is a clarifying question or a discussion question, but I'll ask it, um, when will we be doing, uh, like language specific outreach, for example, in sharing the information about the focus group, I was asked if the interest form is available in Spanish. Um, so. My question is, is it available in Spanish? I don't, don't see it yet. Um, and how, how are we gonna be reaching out to Spanish speakers and other you know, Asian Pacific Islander language um, residents? Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly we want to make sure that our information is accessible. Our website currently does have the ability to um, be translated into Spanish. I don't believe our our um, CEO, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe our focus group um, web form is uh, available in uh, Spanish. We do um, plan on making our survey in Spanish to make sure that um, it has, um, it, it, it is accessible. And then um, I know we've talked about doing um, other 
other meetings potentially um, with interpretation services as well. So we heard some feedback from the uh, CEOC that um, having uh, Spanish language um, is, is important. So we will be offering that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm asking primarily about Spanish is that in our work plan, the Housing Commission work plan, is to improve our outreach to monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, and so in the spirit of achieving our work plan, I hope that we will do some outreach specifically targeted at mono, monolingual Spanish speakers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, yes. We will. Maybe we can discuss that more later. <laughs> yeah, sure. And and Cal popped on. So I don't know if Cal had something else to 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 share on that as well. Yes, I just wanted to know um, when you have the opportunity to visit our housing element webpage. On the right hand side, under related links, um, there is an option to translate into a different language. Right now, it's in Spanish. But if you click that link, you can actually translate it into multiple languages through the Google application. Um, I just tested just now, and you are able to translate the online web form into, say, Chinese or Japanese or any other language of your uh, of your interest. But we can look into making some more refinements so that that capability is more clear. Great, thank you. Thanks, Cal, for the clarification. Yeah. Are there any other clarifying questions, maybe? sparked by other clarifying questions. If not, I'll go to public comment. Okay, people are moving their hands but not raising their hands, so. Okay, do we have any? Oh, I see some hands. Mike, do you wanna handle public comment? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a reminder for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment please engage the raised hand feature and I will then have the ability to open your microphone and you can choose and you can provide uh, your public comment to the Housing Commission. And it does look like our first uh, public comment will be from someone who's calling in and being I do not have your name displayed, uh, please list your first and last name and uh, the person calling in should be able to address the commission now. The Good evening, this is uh, Pamela Jones, resident of Menlo Park. And uh, I first want to welcome Chelsea and, and Heather to the Housing Commission, and also to thank you for being in service to the city of Menlo Park. Um, I have a couple of things, um, and I'm gonna kind of start backwards on the list that I put, put together. Um, and that is rather than always working in silos, um, consider the possibility of having a joint meeting between the Housing Commission, the CEO, C Commission, um, Complete Streets, and the Planning Commission. I know that's a total of 35 people, but all of those commissions and the committee um, are, are critical when it comes to if we're going to look at housing accurately. Um, before I get into the other comments, um, I, I do need to say that it saddens me that um, we fail to recognize the, our um, Spanish speaking community that's been here for several decades. And I, I wonder how accurate the Google translator is for any language. And I think it is critical that the city checks it out with, um, uh, with people that speak in the other languages to make sure that it's translated correctly. Um, I would like to know, or we should know, how many below market or, or affordable at all level units um, need to be built um, considering what's in the pipeline? Um, so we need to know how many are in the pipeline and then how many does that leave us to be built? Um, it also would be helpful that even though this is an information item to have um, uh, an attachment. Um, I don't think we can advertise too much all of the um, everything around the housing element since it is um, uh, so big. And other people may not attend all the commission and committee meetings like some of your um, residents do. Um, I would again like to uh, thank you. And um, wow, I made it under three minutes. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Ms. Jones. And our next, let me restart the clock here. And our next public commenter will be Lynn Bramlett. And Lynn, I will open your microphone and you should be able to unmute and address the Housing Commission. Good evening, everyone. I'm out on a walk, so I hope you don't hear too much background noise. I do want to comment, and I appreciate your work too, and I also welcome the new members. It seems like a very fast track process to um, do all this and also the, to update the safety element and also to do a new environmental justice element. So I guess my general question is, how realistically is this going to work without, you know, perhaps plans that are more for compliance only? And I point out that the prior safety element, I considered a plan that mostly wasn't operationalized. So I am deeply concerned about um, all this, how it's gonna work together. I'm also concerned about not, you know, just it, it's a given that we need to have Spanish translation when we embark on these. And then finally, I have a question about the selection of those in the focus groups. I heard Ms. Chow say they will select folks to participate. So if we could have, I would, through the chair, would appreciate more detail as to how those groups are going to be put together. Are they random? Are some people not going to be part of one, et cetera? And I asked just based on how Ms. Chow um, positioned it. I do also think the group focused on engaging the public, they're, they're going to need fact sheets. They're going to need fact sheets um, related to the facts of the process. And I would say also fact sheets related to the benefit of distributing low income, et cetera, housing all over Menlo Park. So some other cities have produced some really excellent materials aimed at lowering resistance, possible resistance to the idea. And I think they're going to need those tools to do their job effectively. Thank you. This concludes my time. Thank you, Ms. Bramlett. And one moment, Madam Chair. And just as a reminder uh, to anyone in attendance, if you'd like to provide public comment to the commission, uh, please use the raised hand feature. And I do not see any more hands raised, so I will return the meeting to the chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you to the people who made public comment. We appreciate it. Um, so I will start by passing through uh, Ms. Bramlett's question, which was something that passed through my mind as well, is how, how will the, what are gonna be the selection criteria um, for who participates in the focus groups? Great, thank you. So uh, with the homeowners and renters, we, as we talked about, there is the interest form that folks can select. Um, we are excited that we have um, uh, more interested than we can actually have in our um, focus groups. So when I say that we have to select, um, we will have to narrow down um, participants um, so that they are smaller conversations, we're trying to make these intimate, we're trying to you know, have these where people feel more comfortable um, having conversations with, with each other. So it's probably gonna be around 10 to 15 um, people in each of these groups. Um, so I, we will, as I mentioned, be selecting, uh, there will probably be some randomness to it, but I think it also to um, perhaps have you know, folks from uh, different parts of the city, we may be um, also looking at that too, um, if if someone did identify where they do live um, in, in the city. So it, it'll be uh, random, but there may be some um, opportunity for us to look at making sure that there is uh, folks from different parts of the city as part of that conversation. So is, I'm wondering, like, if, well, uh, this is discussion time, so I will go ahead and start discussing and opining. Um, it seems to me that the focus groups would be better served by not being totally random, but being, as you alluded to a little bit, just, you know, try to be representative of different neighborhoods and different race and ethnicity and socioeconomic, whatever 
demographic information you have, try to make sure that it's, you know, reflective of the community. Um, so is there a reason your favor? It seems like you're favoring more random than than strategic. I say random because of the if we if say for example we use um, districts as one of the criteria. So if we put folks partic interested participants in by district, it would be random. I think by who we select out of say district five, um, but the consultant and, and our team are still considering based upon the the number of participants that we receive and who is who has expressed interest. And so we haven't gone through that of, um, you know, of, of you know, who uh, we received applications from yet. So I, I say an element of randomness, um, I would say maybe it's more independent versus random sounds like, but independent selection where, you know, we may identify categories, but then it's, you know, they're, they're selected um, independently of, of of one another. Lauren, go ahead. I saw you sort of put your finger up. Yeah, I was along the same lines. I was really interested. It seemed as though the two main categories you were trying to get folks to apply from were renter or homeowner. Um, do you have other targeted outreach that you're trying to do to gain folks with a diversity of experience from both groups? So if I'm, so uh, Commissioner Bigelow, so if other groups that we're reaching out to in addition to renters and homeowners or looking for specifically expertise from renters and homeowners. Um. So to me, it, it sounded like you weren't particularly targeting any group other than a renter or a homeowner, which most people would fall into, but not all. Um, were there subsets of those populations that you were specifically interested in hearing from and engaging with was what I was interested in. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So I, I wouldn't say there's subsets of those two populations, but there are other focus groups that we are looking to have. So for example, with the business community, we reached out to the Chamber of Commerce to provide us with a sample list of um, businesses uh, located throughout the city, you know, some in the downtown area, uh, some in Bellhaven, some in, in Sharon Heights, um, so that we uh, have some folks that we can reach out to. Um, and then we'll be working with our um, consultant to identify who from, uh, um, who would be from our developer list. So that would be both private uh, developers as well as nonprofit housing developers. And then another group that we're looking to reach out to our um, like service providers. Um, so perhaps someone um, like a Samaritan house who might be providing services. Um, and so we did identify a number of different, um, I would say community partners to help us engage. Um, that's something that the CEOC, um, we provided a, a, a list, certainly not exhaustive. So if you look at the list and, and have suggestions that we can reach out to, we, we made contact with a number of different organizations to help spread the word and to keep folks informed. So I, I think I should emphasize that this is just one opportunity for engagement, certainly not the only um, opportunity, but you know, just smaller conversations to have um, you know, some insights into issues and, and concerns. Um, into the city and then we'll be um, having more opportunities for the public to provide um, similar similar um, feedback as well but wanted to have some of these more uh, more small group conversations um, to help to help um, start the conversation 
Absolutely. And I can appreciate you looking to different, different avenues of involvement in the community. What I want to make sure happens is that um, I'm deeply appreciative of our community members who always show up um, for us and are engaged. I just want to make sure that we widen that scope some so that we can welcome more people to the table to be heard throughout this process. And, and I agree. And I think that is reason why the city council and we believed in the creation of the CEOC is to help widen our, our reach, you know, um, and, and that is, you know, one of our premises and primary, you know, goals of like, we have uh, representation from, you know, throughout the city. And so use, let's use our networks and, you know, so that's uh, meaning, uh, you know, having the ability to reach out to um, folks within the city, but then again, with those, with the organizations, you know, there are folks who, um, maybe outside of our city who are looking to live in the city, you know, and and so reaching out to some of the other organizations to help spread spread the um, the word about our, our efforts and, you know, come and participate at our upcoming events. But Thank yes, you. we, we want to make sure that we're hearing um, from a broader range of, of folks. Thank you. Can you um, tell us a little bit more about the sort of existing condition, existing conditions? You said it's going to be informed by the focus groups, but not solely the focus groups, I hope. Um, no. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about how the existing conditions are assessed and how the site selection process will begin? Because I, I realized just now that we're I've been watching the CEOC meetings and they have a, I think we're all interested in all of this. That's why we signed up. Um, so they have a tendency to want to talk about policy and we just started talking about outreach. So like, I'm thinking, okay, let's let's talk more about policy and, and, and like our role. Um, so in that regard, can you tell us a little, I think it's hard to ask questions about something that we don't really kind of have the ability to imagine. Um, so if you could like shed a little bit more light on. Sure. And, and I don't know if right now is the sort of right forum for, you know, this um, more in-depth conversation, you know, we will be coming back with more um, details for the group to explore. I think um, with existing conditions, there will be, it'll be informed certainly by um, census data. There's a lot of data that's just, that we you know share in terms of like what's our existing population you know how many are housed and, and that is informed by by our our census data i think with the with the um the focus groups and the survey uh that we'll be conducting that will help inform like what are some of the issues that people see what are some of the strategies that we need to focus on um and so that that's that's where that the input will be used to help create um, some strategies that will be bringing forward for conversation with the housing commission. With the site selection um, and the 3000 units, it is a, a combination of uh, sites, uh, you know, like where, what sites can accommodate potentially more housing and then what are some of the strategies that help achieve the housing? So how do we obtain just because you have a site doesn't necessarily mean you'll get 3,000 housing is but what's the right zoning you know what are the right mechanisms to help incentivize um, affordable housing um, and so those are again another conversation that we'll be having with the housing commission um, in those couple of meetings that I, I mentioned, um, mm -hmm. mentioned earlier so we don't have the sites yet we do know it'll be a combination of probably existing um, sites that are under development. Um, so HCD will recognize um, sites that have not yet been uh, finaled or, or completed. Um, I think it's prior to June 2022, if I have my date correct. Um, they will recognize those as part of um, the next RENA cycle. And then um, we'll be looking, you know, potentially for housing, housing opportunity sites and we've uh, 
you know, mentioned a few that have already expressed interest to the city. So SRI being one of them who um, they're looking to uh, redevelop their site, not only with their existing office uses, but also add housing to the site. Um, we know that um, MidPen is working with the Veterans Administration for um, a housing at their VA campus. Um, Ravenswood City School District has also expressed interest in housing at their former flood school site. Um, and then we know that USGS is also going to be um, up for sale in the near future. And so that is um, an, uh, a potential interest for housing at that site as well. So um, these are just some, you know, initial sites that we've heard from uh, either the property owners or you know the city council expressing you know interests like as such as in the USGS site. And then we'll be looking um, probably for you know additional opportunities as it, for example, uh, opportunities to increase the density along the specific plan corridor. Um, you know that those are some of the strategies that will be we'll be discussing. Um, church sites are other areas that um, have, have been a strategy. Um, I know there's been, you know, conversations around ADUs, um, is single family homes, um, looking at, you know, so those are, those are things that we've heard, um, not all things that necessarily will be implemented, but things that we can have conversations around. Um, so question, what happens if August being a time when people take vacations, we don't have a quorum for a housing commission meeting in August? Um, because August is when you suggested you might be able to come to us for conversation on anti-displacement policies and below market rate policies. And that seems really important. Um, and yet I don't want to begrudge anyone their vacation. So not that I, not that anybody asks. Um, <laughs> for permission to take a break from their volunteer role. But anyway, what happens if we don't have a quorum and we can't hold a meeting? Well, hopefully we'll work with Rhonda and Mike to find a potential meeting date. If it's not on the first Wednesday of the month, you know, hopefully we can find another special meeting date that would work that would create a, a quorum so that we could continue to work through our and stay on stay on our on our timeline. So I think we can be flexible, um, but hopefully keeping in that sort of time time range. Yeah. Okay, and I saw Ms. Nguyen had her hand up and then it went down, but I wanna make sure you have the opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Chairwoman Grove, I just want to say that I think some of us were thinking that maybe we would be back face to face. So mm -hmm. that's why we put in the information um, that we wouldn't be here, but if it's still on Zoom, then we will, can certainly attend the meetings. So I think um, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for um, Commissioner uh, Pimentel, but uh, but I know I'll be here as long as we on Zoom. Great, and I don't have any information that we won't have a quorum. Um, I just don't, you know, things okay. happen. People get sick, you know, so, but thank you. I appreciate that. Any other com points of discussion, questions? Commissioner Leach, it would be, and Nguyen, it, feel free to ask anything. I know you're new, you don't have to ask a smart question. I have a I have a just a bunch of dumb questions, but uh, before I ask them, I want to um, do some uh, a, a dive of my own into some of the stuff the uh, information that's already available, um, and I really look forward to it. I'm a total nerd about this kind of stuff, so <laughs> great. Okay, I guess that concludes our conversation about, I'm just checking my notes because I feel like this is such a golden opportunity. Um, but I do not have any more questions. So, and I guess no one else does either. So thank you so much. We've all been really anxious and excited to hear about, you know, how this is gonna work and how we feed in. And it sounds like we're getting ready to start. So thanks. Thank you. And thank you for having us. And Yes, we'll be back and look forward to collaborating. 
yeah, great. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay, so the next item of regular business is D3, but I'd like to take something out of order. Um, and that is the ad hoc subcommittee reports, um, just because I think it's a good subject to follow on, especially fit between what we just heard and the August meeting where we may be discussing policies like the BMR policy. So I think Lauren was gonna give a report from the ad hoc committee. It'd be my pleasure to. Um, so, over the past few weeks, the BMR guidelines ad hoc has met a couple of times because we just can't get enough of policy. Um, but really, Karen, Rachel, and I love this stuff. Um, and so the the committee is is still in its infancy so what we've done is outlined a bunch of work items there are about 30 of them uh, and we went through and prioritized them as a high priority which either was the case if it was something that we thought we could do very easily or if it was something that was incredibly important because it was highly impactful to our community, we thought that was another reason for something to be a high priority or a medium priority or a low priority. And about half of the things on the list um, were high priority. And so some of those items were um, policies, some of them were more administrative, um, and that's how we divided things up. But to give you a brief look, um, we thought that modifying the first time home buyer selection, assets, uh, limiting that would be smart, adding a requirement to being first time home buyer, adding sales price information, removing the annual fee to be on. The, uh, the BMR ownership waitlist, reviewing policies um, about and related to what happens uh, with heirs and BMRs, a gift limit, amending BMR sales and resale time limits, a lot of things, a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Um, but Rachel, I'm going to let you chime in. Well, I was going to just add to for the newer members, um, a little bit of context for this exercise is that. Um, oh, that'd be helpful, huh? Uh, fair enough. <laughs> the walk. Um, but the, um, the reason why this is such an interesting topic and an important one is because the one of the main functions of the Housing Commission is to uh, prove term sheets for um, new developments. So when there is a BMR requirement, an inclusionary requirement, we look at the sheet that says, this is how many units you're gonna provide, and this is what you're required to do, et cetera, et cetera. And we learned from development to development that there are outcomes that we think would be beneficial to the community, that we've heard from the community that would be beneficial in terms of affordability levels, or the number of units, or the size of units, et cetera. And we're not getting those outcomes necessarily. And then there are also some challenges for staff and dealing with developers and not having clarity in the guidelines. And um, those types of, just from our experience, those types of, um, I guess you just call, I mean, they're just, they're just things that happen as you try to implement uh, an ordinance and guidelines. We've realized that it's time for it to evolve and to improve upon. It's always been a living document. And so that's why we're going back through a lot of these really um, very specific details because they actually end up um, affecting the results in ways that we don't always want to see. Um, and we know that we can you know, do better. So that that's um, one of the main reasons why we're uh, looking at the BMR guidelines right now. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. 
Um, I see Heather has her hand up, but Lauren, I, I want to let you like continue and or see if you and or cease and desist and or um, see what, <laughs> pause and, and see what Heather's question is and then continue. Okay. Um, so the only other two things that I would add was we had a lot on the BMR ownership side and rental side. Um, and then some policy modifications and administrative modifications, but we haven't taken on assignment of tasks of any of this stuff. So we just wanted to kind of let you guys know what types of things we were looking at and that we were working on it. Um, because I know that this has been something that has been on our minds a lot lately. Um, and so we're we're making headway, but Heather, I am delighted to meet you over a Zoom screen. Um, same thing with you, Chelsea, and uh, I would love to hear your question. Um, so I um, two things. One, um, where online would I go to find out more about the BMR? Um, and second of all, um, what? How, I, some of this, and if this, if my question goes right to where the what, where all this trove of information is, then I'm happy to go. I have a certain amount of reading I'm going to be doing. But um, how many, how long are people are on the BMR waiting list normally, and who, who is, what's the agency that approves, and is that the social services or the county that approves who gets the houses for the the BMR houses? Those are all excellent questions and they're all up in the air right now um, because not up in the air, that's not a fair thing to say, but we just switch, switched um, BMR administrators so that there is some um, working out of how they're going to do things versus how things have been done. Uh, and they're working with Rhonda regarding that. Okay. So, so most of that's still up in the air and- well, um, Actually, can I ask Rhonda to come on and respond to that question? Because I think two, there are two questions. One is how can I learn more about the BMR program today? And I think Rhonda can email you the guidelines to read. I will tell you, I, when I joined the Housing Commission, the first commission, committee I joined was this one, the BMR committee. And uh, I read them three times before I began to understand them. <laughs> Yeah, um, and partly it's because they have been like remodeled, a good, like it's like a house that's been added on to a bunch of times. So I think that after this iteration, they may be more understandable. And then the second question was sort of like, who decides these things? And I'm gonna let Rhonda. And how long is the, how, uh, what another the waiting question. list? How, how long are people, just the, some of the nuts and bolts stuff about. And I and again, if this is all on a website, I'm no, happy. To go. Those are great questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner Leach. Those are great questions. Um, it, I will send you the link, but our BMR guidelines are available on the city's website. If you and, and for those who are listening, if you navigate to uh, departments on the city website, go to community development, and then go to housing, um, you'll see the the BMR guidelines should be linked there. But I'll be happy to send that out. Uh, in the email link to follow. Um, the BMR guidelines have been updated many times as, as was stated they are, it's sort of a living document uh, over time does need to be updated and, um, and that's the process that's happening now. Um, in regard to your other questions regarding the BMR um, ownership wait list. So my understanding is that there have been there are households that have been on that up to 20 years. Um, so long, long term. Um, and we have, um, so yeah, so each year the households are required to provide some information to update, uh, to confirm that they still want to be on the list, to confirm that we still have their correct contact information. Um, so that's, that's done each year. Uh, in terms of selecting households for um, BMR opportunities, uh, so we have we have a kind of a bifurcated process now uh, with our new BMR administrator. 
formerly we had the BMR ownership wait list. And so everybody had a number by the date that they applied. And so when an opportunity came up that matched their household size and their income uh, range, the next person on the list would have that opportunity. So number one, got that opportunity. Now, th that is to say that if, if their number one on the list was a household of six people and we had a studio opportunity, obviously that's not a match. So we would go to the next you know, household size on the list. Maybe, maybe number three is two people and, and offer them an, uh, the opportunity. So we still have that and we still honor that and use that. And we were calling that our legacy list. Um, and then now the new, uh, with our new house keys BMR administrator, um, we are, are going to allow anyone to, um, to apply for the opportunities when a, when a sale comes up. However, the list, the list, our legacy list takes priority. So if no one, if there's no uh, household on our legacy list that is interested or qualifies for the opportunity, then we can offer the opportunity to those other, other folks not on the list. Does, I hope that makes sense. So a way, it's a way to kind of blend it, open it up. Um, we want to make sure, the reason we're doing, uh, have made this change is that we wanna make sure that we always um, seize the opportunity <laughs> to offer a BMR ownership unit to a qualified household. So we don't wanna be in a circumstance where we've exhausted our list and don't have anyone qualified and lose that opportunity because what happens with BMR um, units that are for sale, we have a clock that starts ticking. Whether it's a brand new unit that's just constructed, we may have 180 days to complete the sale from the certificate of occupancy. So once we find an eligible household, they have to go get their financing in place. And so all of that takes some time. So that six months can, can go by pretty quickly. <laughs> and uh, um, and then, and then there's also what we have, we have resales. So when somebody's in a BMR unit and they want to move, uh, move along and sell that unit as a resale, uh, we also have a, that clock ticking. So we have a, a pretty short amount of time to find eligible buyers. So sometimes when we go through that legacy list, um, we can exhaust that list, believe it or not. Um, and, and so it's nice to have this other, uh, allow others to get on the list um, and have an opportunity if no one on the legacy list um, expresses interest or is qualified. So how many people are on their own legacy list? Um, I'm gonna ask Mike to verify. I want to say, Mike, is it, is it, you wanna, why don't you, <laughs> sure. I think he has sure. a better handle on those numbers. No problem. Happy, happy to assist. Yeah, we, we have roughly um, between 125 and 150 folks who are on the ownership legacy list. And then we have additional folks who um, either sign up for the ownership opportunities um, and or rental opportunities as well. So um, in total, when we recently transitioned at the beginning of the year to a new provider, we had roughly around uh, just over 200 folks total. So that would be rental and ownership combined um, on the list. And then, um, you know, with house keys, um, it's online platform. I think we're, we're expanding folks who are interested in, in, opportunities in Menlo Park. Thank you. Sure thing. Mike. Commissioner Nguyen, can, you, can I um, ask you to say your last name so I make sure I'm saying it right? Chelsea, can you, can you pronounce yes. your last name? Nguyen. The last name is Nguyen. Nguyen, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry if, if I'm going back to the uh, other subject here, um, the exercise that Ms. Horse and uh, uh, Bigelow and uh, Chairwoman Grove have done. I'm just wondering what is number one, what is the point of exercise? Two, what are you gonna do with that now that the exercise is over? I mean, what are your plans? And number three, why is, was the exercise not include the other commissioners? the past commissioners? I'm curious. Okay, I can answer that. So we, the way we sometimes operate is to create these ad hoc committees. It's sort of like a working group. Um, and ad hoc means it's not a standing committee. So this committee 
was, I, I joined a previous ad hoc committee years ago to work on the BMR guidelines updates. We did two rounds of updates. We had a third one in the works, but city council got distracted and never went through. So there's a list of things that we want to do that the commission as a whole wants to do. And the way our ad hocs work is the ad hoc will meet in between meetings and do some work and then come back to the commission with some recommendations, which we're not ready to do yet, though that's not what this is today. Um, we will come back to the main commission with either progress updates, questions for input or whatever. And then eventually we'll have a proposal. The whole commission will vote on it, discuss it and vote on it. And then we'll make move that recommendation either to planning commission or to city council for approval. So at one point we had a below market rate commission, you know, ad hoc committee. We had a in lieu fee, it's called the nexus study committee. We had a policy committee. We had a marketing committee. We had all these different ad hoc committees. So that's how it worked. And this committee was formed last meeting or two meetings ago, I can't remember. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, but I'm just wondering why, um, what about the other commissioners, the former commissioners um, or the current one? Uh, were Super they on good question. Committees, they are not? Okay, I see. So one of the things about being on the commission is that we're only allowed to talk with a certain number of individuals about certain things. Otherwise, it has to be considered uh, what there has to do noticing and it has to be a public meeting and all of these things. And it, yep, called Brown Act stuff. Um, and so we three um, volunteered to be part of this commission when at uh, the okay. thank you, the the calm something something. Um, and back when it was created, when it, it seemed like there was a need to have further discussion uh, outside these monthly meetings so that we could bring work items back um, to them, potentially recommend to city council um, that they take on, uh, so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Of course. Rachel. Well, I would like to add to that we usually come or any ad hoc comes back and reports out um, and with the help of staff and when we finally reach a point where there's recommendations, then there's usually a staff report involved and there's an opportunity to give feedback. So I wasn't on a couple of these ad hoc committees, but I was on the commission and I still had the opportunity to react to what their recommendations were. It's just that they did the bulk of the more intensive work and background work. So um, my understanding is that this type of thing will still come before the commission and be deliberated before the public, before we make final recommendations, but that we kind of tee it up um, as a subcommittee that has, or excuse me, as an ad hoc committee that has done a little extra work on it. So when, when are you gonna be bringing it to the, uh, in, in front of the commission? this commission and to talk about in detail of each different so you know. yeah so normally this would norm this segment of the agenda is normally at the end and it's called section e reports and announcements and e1 is ad hoc committee reports um, often we've had three ad hoc committees and so we have that opportunity on every agenda to report to the commission our progress. Um, it's not a time for discussion, it's just a time for updates or you know, information to be provided to the rest of the committee, commission. Is but you know, if you have any input or like things you want the committee to know or think about, I think, Rhonda, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that you can deliver that information to Rhonda who can then navigate Brown Act considerations and insert your concerns into the committee's work. Rhonda, is that correct? No, I, I was just curious. I just want to know, uh, the, is the public allowed to be, uh, to listen in to all aspects, the entire meeting? 
there is not going to be like a closed session at all, right? Is that correct for, for the Housing Commission? The public will be able to hear um, information from the ad hoc committee. Just exactly like is happening now, the public can hear our update. So every time we give an update, it'll be at this public meeting and the public can hear it. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just add one just for the new commissioners and anyone who's listening from the public, an example of why our BMR update is, one of the reasons our BMR update is important. Um, recently, we, we heard, I mean, like Rachel said, we hear these below market rate agreement terms and we opine on them. We either recommend them or, or recommend against, but you know, it's not like we don't have any, we can't dictate to the developer as long as they're in compliance, we can't dictate anything. We just can sometimes ask. Asking doesn't usually work, especially with a large significant development. If they're meeting the requirements, then they don't have to do anything different. Um, so recently the two Graystar projects, which are also streamlined projects per state bill, Senate bill 330, they're meeting the below market rate requirements, um, but not in a way that like we had a choice sort of, we could recommend one of two options, either all of the below market rate, inc below market rate units could be affordable to residents who have low incomes as defined by the housing department, or we ask them to please come up with an alternative mix that is financially equivalent to the, the subsidy that would be all low income, but a mix of very low income, low income and moderate income. So when they went to planning commission, the next step, they had both alternatives. And it was a really choice of two bad things. I mean, not bad, but neither one was suiting the needs of the community because low income is, I think, about eighty or ninety thousand dollars per individual, and the median income for a family of four in, or maybe that's a family of four, the the uh, the income that would be required to afford a low income unit would have been like fifty percent higher than the median income in Bellhaven. And these are developments that are going into Bellhaven. So it would be nice if the quote unquote affordable units would be affordable to people who live in Bellhaven. But our guideline doesn't require that. And it's for all sorts of structural reasons, like the way this whole program is defined and the way low income and very low income and moderate income are defined it uses data that's old and it doesn't take into account the extreme income gap that we have in place now that we didn't have in place 20 years ago. So, or not as much. So anyway, it just doesn't really work in our favor. So we had a choice between two non-ideal options. And so we have an opportunity as we rewrite our below market rate guidelines to at least move that in the direction of better serving our community. It may not be perfect, but we can certainly improve upon it. Um, so that's, for example, the, the two projects that I'm talking about were Graystar. They were either gonna be all low income or like maybe three very low income, and then a third of them low income, and then a whole bunch at moderate income, which is actually right now, the rents of a moderate income unit are the same as market rate rents. So I'm like, ah, that's not exactly what we were hoping for. So it didn't give us either option, did not make us extremely pleased. So that's why it's in, we really feel a sense of priority to update this. It was one, one of the reasons. Um, and when will this update be finalized? Uh, I don't. Would it is, there, is there a deadline? Is there a time where we have to make that's it? A, that's a great question. And as we've just embarked on this this past month, 
I think that we're probably not at a place where we can say exactly what the timeline is right now, but I imagine that we'll have a better idea in coming months how long things will take. Um, and I think we're probably going to try and focus on bringing some of these high priority items forward as soon as we can but um, it's not all entirely dependent upon us um, and, and our availability, unfortunately. So we still have to. But there's a couple of things coming up. Um, there's some below BMR, BMR ownership units that are entering the resale cycle. So some of the things related to resale of below market rate ownership units are you know, time sensitive. So that's on, on our radar. And either we're gonna get it done before that ha all happens, or if that all happens and we haven't beat the deadline, then the priority will probably go down on, on those particular changes. Um, because the other thing that's coming down the pike is the SRI development will be an opportunity for below market rate housing. We wanna make sure that that serves the needs of the community. So that's a different topic. That's the, the rental um, guidelines. So those are the, and, and but to, to let you know, I think right now we're kind of on a pace of meeting once a week. And so we're, we're, we're picking up our pace, right? <laughs> Rachel made a funny face. Well, that comes to a grinding halt now. Um, I would also say to staff, I mean, it's also dependent upon staff capacity, right? Because Rhonda and, and Mike always help um, with the final report out and uh, framing the issue and um, actually writing a staff report. So it's also dependent on their yeah. availability, right? Yeah. Any other questions on the BMR ad hoc committee report? Okay. So now we're gonna move on to the thing that was next before I change the agenda order, which is the selection of housing commission chair and vice chair. And so this is always a, a weird process. Um, so in the past, we have sidestepped the weirdness of it by just sort of following in order of seniority and passing on the role of chair to the next, to the vice chair generally. I mean, it's a nomination process. So we can do whatever we want and anybody can nominate anybody and then we'll vote. But traditionally, I'll just tell you, I would nominate Rachel. Rachel might nominate someone for vice chair and between those two things, we would vote. So I'm gonna do something a little different this time. I'm going to define my gender stereotype and I'm gonna nominate myself as chair. And I'm not doing that because I think I'm such a great chair um, because all of our chairs have been great. Um, I'm just doing that because there is a learning curve and we have the housing element bearing down upon us. We have these BMR updates and I feel like I have a good pace. I've talked to Rachel about this too because she would be sort of the next in line. Um, she and I work really well together with Rhonda and so we're, I am offering to do this another year, but that's it. That's one nomination. Anyone else can nominate anyone else. Um, and I'd be very, very happy with any outcome. Um, but I just wanted to offer that. It's unusual. I'm a little embarrassed um, because I don't want it to seem like, uh, you know, anyway, because like, because that's our gender stereotype thing. Anyway. <laughs> so when do we have to vote on this? Um, well, I will pause and see if there are other nominations for chair. Well, we don't have uh, everyone here, right? John isn't here. Right, but we have a quorum, so. So we have to make a decision tonight. That's what you're saying. That is, I, I believe so. Rhonda, do we have to make a decision tonight or can we? I see a decision is expected tonight. It's agendized and you do have a quorum. Mm -hmm. Okay. We could continue the item though, right? If we wanted to. I mean, technically. You, you technically could, um, but based on the timeline for um, nominations, this is this is the time of year um, to do to do so. 
Well, um, I don't know. I actually don't remember how this happened before um, with nominations. If it's a number of, it, well, with a nomination, there comes a vote, right? So it only takes one nomination. It would be redundant for me to also nominate you, Karen. Um, but I will say um, also to take into consideration that um, during a large portion of uh, Karen's uh, tenure as chair, it was a little bit out of the ordinary because of shelter in place. and. We lost out on at least a couple of meeting times, uh, meetings because of just getting in the swing of things with Zoom. So um, some of the work definitely felt uh, somewhat deferred. Um, so this kind of created a little bit of extraordinary circumstances as well. So I would just put that out there for consideration. Um, and I would I would support Karen also remaining chair, but um, just keeping that in mind as a, as a background. It's been quite the ride. You know, I uh, wasn't going to do this, but um, because I just feel like I understand we have a quorum, but I was uh, hoping that we would have full house. But uh, I believe that it's time for um, for someone new. It's time for uh, for just uh, out of box thinker. I think that we need fresh new voices. So since I don't know anyone here, and this is my first time, I'm gonna nominate myself. Number one, I know a lot about Ratner and um, the 1969 uh, state mandate regarding housing element. In fact, I did my um, research paper on that. I I'd already knew before Ms. Chow gave the presentation tonight that we need, we are allocated 2946. Um, so I knew all of this already. Additionally, I don't think anyone here on the commission knows as much except Rhonda. Rhonda, she's not, she's staff, know about BMR as much as I do because I am a BMR homeowner. Uh, I have lived in this city for more than 40 years. I I know all of the rules and regulations that have changed over the years. And I don't think that anyone is more knowledgeable in terms of professional and personal experience in this matter. So I think if we are talking about being a chair and understanding the issues, the important issues that we are facing in our city today, I believe that I'm the best candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for chair? Okay. Um, Mike, I need help now. What happens next? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I just wanted to. Uh, also, just a quick reminder, being this is a, a regular uh, meeting item, we do need to also um, ask for public comment. Ah, so good. I just wanted to give that reminder before we got too far ahead of ourselves. Okay. Um, can we take public comment now? Absolutely. Um, so for, for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, please engage the raised hand feature now, and I will then have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide your public comment to the Housing Commission. And I'll just give it a second. And I do not see any hands raised, so I will return the meeting to the chair. And uh, Rhonda and I are happy to answer any questions that, that come up if there's. Okay, so do we, how do we, do, do we vote on one nominee and then the other, or do we, and then like, I've seen it done different ways at city council meetings when they do this sort of thing. So just tell me the process. I think I think what I remember is, I think it's kind of weird, but like I was nominated first. So we would vote on me. And if I get a majority of votes, then I'm the chair and we move on to the vice chair. Is that the way it works? Yeah, and I don't want to, um, I'll let Rhonda chime in as well, just okay. to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but yes, I would, I can, I can call 
for a roll call vote and list each member of the commission who's commission who's present um, at this meeting and would ask for your uh, for your vote for for either nominee. Um, but we can run through the first nomination and the second nomination if that, that is necessary. Okay. All right. And I'll let Rhonda um, make sure that I'm Confirm. understanding how we would move forward as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Mike, Mike uh, explained that um, the correct way. So, yes, I agree. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, I feel like Rachel and I have already sort of expressed our, our, our opinion. So, may I take the roll call vote out of order and go to Heather first, and then Ray, and then Lauren, because I, I sort of feel like I want you all to have a chance for your vote to to sway others. Um, is that okay, Mike? You go in that order. Sure, I would. Yeah, I, I, actually, I I typically go um, alphabetically by last name, so it would be uh, Commissioner Bigelow would actually oh, go first okay. on how I would so. normally call uh -huh. roll call, so that works out um, just just fine. Okay, so Commissioner Bigelow. So, um, oh, wait, do we, oh, need motion? Can... do we need a motion a second first, actually? Um, the so moved. Yeah, and I, I don't, um, yeah, I think it probably is best um, to do a motion in a second. I don't know if that's necessary for nominations. I think it's, um, Rhonda, would you mind jumping in on this mm -hmm. as well? Do we need a second for a nomination? Uh, sure, it's it's safe. It, it's fine to do that. And so we do have a motion and a second to um, take a vote on uh, for uh, Chair Grove as the continuing chair. So we can, Mike, you can go ahead and call roll um, on that. Um, and uh, following that, if there, um, we can uh, take the second item. We are fortunate to have two nominees for chair tonight. Um, so if uh, Chair Grove, if we don't have a um, consensus on that, then we can move. Uh, to the second nomination. Okay. Okay, and I, I can take over from here, um, right. Chair Grove, if that's okay with you. you. I would appreciate that. Okay. Apologies, are we going out of order or are we going in order? In order is fine. Okay. okay I'm then... a little, okay, I missed the vote. I'm sorry, there's already a motion on the table. Never mind. Yeah, I so think. I think Heather moved. I didn't catch who second. Is, is that right? You moved. I don't know who moved and seconded. Okay. Heather moved. Who seconded? I'll second. I, okay. Yeah. I, I was actually going to clarify okay. that. I don't right. think we had a second just yet, but we okay. did not. Okay. Thank you. But I just did. All so. right. I would okay. register that I'm still slightly uncomfortable with the small number of us here this evening. Mm. I, I can, I can, I can still move forward with a vote. And if you'd like to abstain, you can, and and that's a, a one way to approach can it. I, I'll just say, as one of the people who nominated myself, that I'm I would be fine with continuing it if we think we're going to have better attendance next month. Rhonda, you did a poll. What are the consequences of of continuing this to the next meeting, Rhonda? I don't believe there are any consequences um, other than getting off schedule. And uh, the attendance will not be a full attendance for the next two months. So mm -hmm. there will not be full attendance in August, nor will there be in September. So there will not likely be um, more than five members at the, this or the next two meetings. Rhonda, uh, I say that I wouldn't be here next month, but remember if we on Zoom, I would be able to. So I don't know about um, the other commissioner. So I think we have to take in consideration where how people have responded to you because for the survey, because we did not know uh, if this was gonna be an in-person meeting. So, so you have to take in consideration, you can't, I mean, we can't really say that we won't have a full house next month because we don't know, right? Because on Zoom, I will be, I'll be here. So we do actually, I, I do recall. And so I was including your response in that. So, and so I think, I mean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm not sure, but I think also Commissioner uh, Pimentel will be here as well if it's on Zoom. 
Yeah, and he has not responded yet. Um, you responded uh, that you were not attending, but now I understand you are. So that would bring us up to six commissioners um, at, that have responded positively for the August meeting. And, and then we haven't heard from Commissioner Pimentel. So potentially- I, I, I think he's out of uh, uh, his reception area. That's, that's the thing. Okay. So, so I move that we continue into the next and um, hold the vote next in August. There seems to be a certain amount of discomfort. I'm comfortable voting, but you know, I think it's, um, I don't think there's, it doesn't sound like there's any repercussions for waiting a month, waiting until the next one. Right. I, I would second that motion. Okay, all in favor to continue with this item, raise your hand. All right, we will continue this item. And, and we'll continue the vice chair nomination as well. I assume that's what we meant by our vote. I think so. It, yes, it was a combined agenda item. So, okay, excellent. So we're on to reports and announcements. Um, and uh, we did the BMR guidelines ad hoc meeting and commissioner updates. Do we have any individual commissioner updates? I have one, which is just that the housing element introduction webinar was definitely worth watching. Um, and so I recommend that it's available as are all of our meetings now on the city's YouTube channel. Um, and I wonder if, if it's, this isn't a commissioner update, but it'd be great if those were linked to somehow from the housing commission website and the housing element website. Um, so I'll just go a little bit out of order and say that. I don't know if that's possible. Um, but so the, but the city has a YouTube page and the video is available. It's an hour long. Um, there were polls and questions. You can see our consultants in action. Um, there's, you know, not perfect, but it's good to see things um, starting. And it was it was a good slide deck. Um, that's my update. Anything else? Okay, staff updates. Rhonda, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Grow. I think we skipped one, which is the recommend E3, recommend future agenda items. Oh, you're right, we did. Okay, any recommended future agenda items? What we have is continuing conversation about or updates on BMR ad hoc committee and the housing element um, item that Deanna forecast for us. Anything else? Okay. All right, Rhonda, now you have the floor. Okay. Um, also, I uh, just wanted to add to the to the previous item, to the future agenda items, if um, as we have um, some new commissioners here tonight, if you do have any items that you'd like to recommend um, be placed on a future agenda, please reach out to the chair um, and, and then the chair will reach out to staff. Um, the the chair, chair meets with staff to prepare agendas um, each month. So just a reminder of that in case something comes up that you didn't think of tonight, but you'd like to add to, a, to an agenda. Um, and then so staff updates. I have a few just, um, and you may be aware of this if you've been watching the council meetings, but um, just wanted to let you know that the city council approved the budget uh, for 2021, which included the American uh, Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, they approved 250,000 for eviction and incidental related assistance. Um, so, and they also approved 125,000 for rental and mortgage outreach assistance. Um, if you probably heard in the news that there's been a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, well, not a lot, but there's been a slow um, processing of applications for rental assistance. So um, we're going to work with some of our community-based organizations to try to help get the word out to all tenants and landlords to, to help um, spread that word that the funds are available. So some of those funding will be used for that. And given that we want to do this in the near term, 
um, I'll be working and reaching out to some of the community-based organizations to develop um, funding agreements so that we can get that in place and they can start those activities in the near term. And then we, uh, the city provided funds to Samaritan House to distribute for emergency rental assistance. So I'll be working with Samaritan House um, to look at updating their funding agreement to provide them with additional funds uh, for, to provide eviction, um, funds for eviction, uh, to prevent eviction. So my second announcement is just related to eviction moratorium. Um, so you probably are all aware that the um, state eviction moratorium was set to expire uh, uh, June 30th. And just within a few days of that expiration, the federal government um, uh, enacted a eviction moratorium. And a few days later, the state enacted an eviction moratorium. Um, staff was working on um, some background and research to help support a, a possible um, local emergency eviction moratorium um, for council consideration, should that have been necessary, but uh, we were able to stop that because the state, state um, moratorium took effect. Um, and so with the state moratorium, um, it will run through, um, it'll, it'll prohibit evictions through uh, September 30th. Um, and the state uh, uh, also is going to increase um, the funding uh, for rental assistance. Um, previous, uh, previously, they only provided 80% of back rent, but now they will cover 100% of back rent for um, tenants that could not pay rent between, I think it was, um, was it March? The dates, March, uh, March of, sorry. I think March of last year through uh, September of this year. Um, so anyways, the, those funds are available and the application process has been expedited. Previously, it was a 32 page application process, which is difficult for anybody to go through. But if you're a tenant who wasn't able to pay your rent to try to get that application completed and work with your landlord, made it extremely difficult. So that's been expedited. Um, and outreach is, is increasing. Uh, Samaritan House and others are expanding outreach. So I think all of that's good news, um, but I think the city um, providing the additional funding assistance to help get that word out, help uh, get those applications completed um, is really gonna be beneficial to help, helping keeping, help, help keep people in their homes and prevent eviction. And then finally, just last, just to mention that, I uh, wanted to mention that the Graystar Menlo Portal Project is tentatively scheduled to um, go to the Planning Commission on July 26th. Um, and so if you will recall that the um, Housing Commission made some recommendations for them to consider some, um, the equivalent alternative to all low income uh, BMR units and that is moving forward. So uh, just to watch for that staff report and um, uh, there's opportunity for public comment uh, at that meeting should you have. So that's all, that's all for me, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that concludes our meeting. Um, so with that, I don't think we need a motion in the second or vote. I will adjourn the meeting at 828. It's one of our shorter meetings, just so you know, new newbies. <laughs> well, I was expecting three hours, so yeah, I got an hour back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She's easing you in nice and slow. That's what's happening. <laughs> I have some reading to do between now and <laughs> the next. Perfect. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being here and good night all. Yeah. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks.